methods are something else that should be one of the first things. I keep saying that, right? Like everything's the first thing you need to learn about the language. But all right, we're getting to it. We already know how to do it, but we're getting to it. Learn about methods and implementation hiding. Write methods with no returns and no return value. Write methods that require a single argument or multiple arguments. Write a method that returns a value. Pass array values to a method. Learn some alternate ways to write a main method header. Something that would be interesting to see that I don't see covered in here, unless there's a more things in here, is to how to pass a non-predetermined number of methods to an argument. I think you can do that in this language. I'm absolutely sure you can in Java. So for example, if you're going to be passing in one thing or two things or three things or 70,000 things, you shouldn't have to pack them into an array in order to call the method. I'll remind myself about that. So what is a method? It's a body of code with a name that performs a task. Well, we've been using methods every day since day one because the main method is also a method. It's got a name, main, and it's got a body of code. When your code uses a method, it's called invoking or calling. So, you know, if we're being all fancy, we'll say, okay, main invokes the blah blah method, or, you know, main calls the blah blah method. So, for example, the main method. It had to have a very specific syntax. In this particular language, main had to be capitalized, unlike C, C++, and Java. They had to be different. Well, that's because C-sharp, they decided that method names looked really cool if they were in uppercase. Not standard, industry standard, but it, it certainly is for C-sharp. That's why right line is capitalized, whereas print ln in Java is not capitalized. So this is a method that's taking one argument. What if it had placeholders, right? It had three placeholders in it. Then we'd have to pass in three more arguments separated by commas. Now that's what I'm talking about, writing a method that can you know, accept multiple numbers of, ar of arguments. So if the chapter does not show that in this chapter, we will learn that anyways, because it's useful information. So implementation hiding, an important principle of object-oriented programming keeps the details of a method's operations hidden. So if I have something like this, you know, inside main, whatever, right? Absolutely do not be typing this. You know, and I have something called open file, like that, and then I have f equals read file. Oh, see here, I'm, I'm violating C-sharp standards. All right, right, like that and then close file, something like that, and then we do something with R, whatever we were going to do. All right, now that's a little bit too generic, right? But you get the idea. Once we have written the method, if you gave your class to somebody else, they wouldn't necessarily need to know the nitty-gritty details about how open file did its work. They just need to know what it's going to do, what they pass it, what it's going to return, if there are any exceptions that it throws. You know, they need to know that kind of thing. Just like if we do lookup, you know, we, we ask Microsoft, you know, how their POW function works. They don't give us the code. Or, you know, for their square root function, heaven forbid, they don't show us how they calculate the square root. But uh, we don't need to know how the square root is called, or how it functions. We just need to know how to call it. Same business with these. So when you write a method, your goal is to make it so that the calling code doesn't have to know too much about how the method works. If you write methods that rely upon too much information about how they work, or heaven forbid, you have to have something set up, and then you have to have something set up here, and then you have to have something set up here, and so these things are not themselves setting it up, Instead, they're requiring you to bounce information around to get all that to happen, and then these were inside a class. That's called coupling, right? This thing is tightly coupled to that or inappropriately coupled to that. You have to call them in the exact order, and you have to have external information being tracked. We shouldn't have to do that if we design a well-designed class. Not that this is talking about classes yet, but we're talking about methods, which are one of the two components of classes, the other being data. A class is just a collection of data, and then the methods 
that use that data. So encapsulation, detail hiding, implementation hiding, is just making it so that the code down here doesn't need to know a lot about how the code somewhere else works. And you think to yourself, well, I'm the programmer. I'm supposed to know how all that works. Yeah, OK, so when you write the open file method, you better know how all it works. But when you code it down here in the client code in main, you ought to be able to show it to somebody else, and they'll understand what it's doing even without knowing the details. Or if your code gets passed on to a maintenance programmer, you know, after you quit, or you get hired for a new position, or you go on to write better things, then they need to be able to look at the code and understand it from a high level detail. And then if they need to blip in and find out exactly what these are doing, they can. So the only concern is the way you interface, the way you interact with the method. In other words, how you invoke it, what arguments you have to pass to it, and what you're going to get back out of it. The program doesn't need to know how the method works. The program only needs to know how to call it and what arguments to pass to it and what it returns, which is why any time you write a method, you have to declare those things, right? I'm going to write a method called sum, and it's going to take two arguments that are integers, and it's going to return an int. That's all that this code down here needs to know about it. Now, when we call it down here, when this code invokes it, it better pass in two integers, unless we've done something to allow it to skip passing in parameters like um, setting default values or something like that. But in general, the code's going to know what you could call the header or the signature. The prototype is what C++ calls it, right? How the method is called, meaning which parameters you have to pass in with arguments, and then what it's going to return. Without that information, the calling code wouldn't be able to call it. If you get it wrong, then it won't compile, right? If you only pass in one int rather than two, or you pass in a string and it's expecting an int, something like that. If it's not something that can be that the compiler will easily convert from one format to another, it won't compile. It doesn't always have to be of the exact same types, because if that was a double and we tried to pass in a, an int, right, like that, no problem, because a one can fill in a double just as easily as it can fill in an int, right? They're compatible types when you're going from the wimpy int type into the awesome eight byte double type. The true, the alternative is not true. And in this language, unlike C++, which is really loosey-goosey, you can't pass a double in and have it get converted into an int on the fly. And the reason for that is the point two would get truncated off. It would lose it. And so if you really want that to happen, you'd better cast it, right? That would let it, this code change this double into an int. And then he would be able to accept it as his parameter variable. So the method that uses another method is called the client of that method. Another textbook that I use calls it the driver. So I will occasionally call it the driver, but I much prefer the term client, so I doubt it. Right? So if we look in here, this code is the client of whatever these methods are. Right? And then this method may call another method. Right? I don't know what it's going to call. It calls something called foo. Right? So this method is the client of that method, and so on. Methods exist in a so-called black box, a virtual device, if they're well written, that you can use without knowing how they work internally. How many times can we restate that? I think it's about overkill at this point. So the major reasons to create a method. The code will remain short and easy to follow, meaning that this part is a lot shorter than it would have to be otherwise. You know, these methods may be 100 lines long each, but when you look at the main code, it's very short. And then if these methods are 100 lines long each, then perhaps they need to be broken up into methods as well. You know, somebody kind of made up the rule that if your function or method is more than a page of code long, you ought to find a way to break it up. You know, that's not very precise, right? But by the time your code gets to the point where you have to, one method 
you have to scroll up and down for 20 pages in order to figure out you know how it's working it probably could have been broken up into subtasks into other methods so the method has okay and it avoids code bloat which is unnecessarily long or repetitive statements just like loops let you run something over and over and over so instead of copying and pasting the code of that you can just write it in a loop and it'll execute 10 times same with methods if there's 20 lines of code that you're going to need to happen again and again and again don't copy and paste those 20 lines instead put them in a method and then call that method whenever you need it when you write your method you're going to write the method declaration known as the header the definition gotta have lots of words for everything I like the term header or I like the term declaration and then you have a curly brace and you have some code and you have a closing curly brace so in here this is the declaration of it this is the header right describes everything about it and then it's got a curly brace and then some code and then a closed curly brace So the method declaration does a lot. It defines the rules for how the method can be used. Optional declared accessibility, meaning is it public, protected, or private? Optional static modifier. Static means that you don't use it with a specific object, that you call it instead based with a class name, so you don't even have to have an object in order to use it. The return type, you always have to have that. The method name. Always got to have that. Parentheses with a list of method parameters, what I've been calling parameter variables, and the closing parentheses. So declaration has to have these things mandatory to have all that. And then you can customize how it is called or where it can be called with the accessibility, which are things like public and private, and whether it's static or not. So if something is declared as private, it means that only things inside that class can access it. About time to create one of our projects. Looks like we're on lecture QRS. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Guess I should have just clicked there. New project, Baron Life. Alrighty. Alrighty. So I'm going to write a silly little method. I'm going to put it in a class for it to be accessed from a static context. It also has to be static. I seem to have erased my curly brace. That's a bad idea. All right. So public, static, void, meaning it doesn't return anything. Hello, parentheses in parentheses. This is just obviously a very, very short example. CW tab tab, and it prints out hello. So down here we can call it inside main. Main is the client of the hello method. Hello. Since this is static, it means it can be called without having an object to refer to. If the static keyword was gone, it would be called an instance method, meaning that you have to have an instance, an object, to call it by. If we were not in the same class as we are when this method is defined, we would have to prefix it with the name of the class. We'd have to type program, is it dot? Yeah, dot hello. You can see it lights up blue. This is not the name of any object, it's the name of the class that we're currently in. But you don't got to do that because they're both inside that class already. So there's no reason to prefix that unless you just feel like it, right? You could calling static method 
could also be called as program dot hello parentheses and parentheses. So if we're going to demonstrate that, let's change this to private. And uh, spoiler alert, it's not going to make a, uh, a bit of difference for how it works. So I'll probably undo it. Right? I forgot my read line and all that, but it compiled, so it worked. Console.readline, capital R, capital L. All right, so it worked whether it was public or private. What public or private means is that if it's public, any code anywhere in the project can use it. If it's private, only other methods inside the same class can access it. So with this being private, nobody else could call this hello method. If it was set up to public, then any other class in, this, in the same project and the same solution would be able to do it. Let's demonstrate that by creating another class. Well, we're not in a chapter about talking about classes at work. Yeah, so what we've been using classes since day one. Class, I'm just going to call it dummy. Open curly brace, and it's going to have a method named hello as well, or howdy. Why not howdy? Public static void howdy. Parentheses in parentheses. Open curly brace. CW tab tab. Howdy. It's very friendly. Howdy, partner. It's from a cowboy movie. Now, if we want to call that from inside main down here, we can't just do howdy. If I type in howdy, parentheses in parentheses, this is an error. The reason why is that this method is not part of the program class where main is. It's part of a different class. So we need to specify what class it is a part of. Now, if it was not declared as static, we would not be able to do it this way. We would not be able to name the class. We would instead have to create an object. That's a lecture for another day. For now, I'm going to say dummy, col or dummy dot howdy. That calls this static method in another class. Calls static method in the dummy class. So if we were going to make some notes for ourselves, down here at the bottom, why is that underlined? I have it outside main. That's why. That's why I should always put my little comments. This is the end of main. This is the end of the class. All right. And it goes here. CW tab tab. Nope, nope, nope. Console dot. And since. Can we just do read line without having to do that? Nope. All right, fine. Console dot read line. If we did a using console, didn't we try that last time? All right, anyways. In the past. All right, so notes. Methods can be static, or I'm just going to call it non static. There is no non static keyword. A static method is a class method that is invoked using the name of the class followed by a dot. You can skip the class name if the client is in the same class as the method. A non-static, just leave off the static keyword. I kind of wish non-static was a keyword that you was optional. I don't know. Just leave off the static keyword. 
is an instance method. I'm going to put instance in quotes even though I didn't put class in quotes. Shoulda. I'm going to go back and modify that and make this a class method. Is an instance method that is called using the name of an object followed by the method name or followed by the dot followed by a dot and the method name so an example of static methods would be math class methods right you don't want to have to create a math object just to figure out the square root of something I don't want to have to create a console object just to use right line and read line. Hello Java, thanks for making me do that every time. So that means that this is a static method because we're just using it by the name of the class. And if we used math.pow or square root or whatever, whatever the name of that function and class are, those are also static methods. We do not have to create a math object in order to do that. On the other hand, when we made up our random number generator, we actually had to create a random object, right? Random space R and D equals new random. We had to create a new object in order to call the function that would return us a new number. Excuse me, method. So public and private. When you use a method's complete name like that, including the class name, that's its fully qualified name. So when I did program.hello, that was its fully qualified name. But then I figured out I could leave off the program dot because I was already in that class. But when I called dummy.howdy, I had to have the fully qualified name because we were not inside the howdy class when we called it. We were inside the program class. All right, so different levels of accessibility. Public means it can be called anywhere. Private means only methods inside that class can call it. So if we made the howdy class, excuse me, the howdy method private, only other things inside the dummy class would be able to access it. And then there are some intermediate ones. Protected means that only things inside that same class can call it, but also things that are inherited from it. And then there's protected internal, which I don't fully, fully comprehend, but can assemblies or projects that contain this class access this method? To me, this is the same one as the default Java access level, where if you do not specify public, private, or protected, it comes out to being package accessibility, meaning anything that's in the same package can access it, but nobody else. I think that's what that means. And then internal. Can derived classes use it? No. But can assemblies and other projects use it? Yeah, that's kind of weird. Honestly, public, protected, and private are the ones to remember, in, in my opinion. Public means everybody can get a hold of it. Protected means only that class and its subclasses, its child classes, things that inherit from it. And private means it's really greedy and nobody can access it, even the child classes. I had a grandparent like that. Small joke. All right. So you can declare a method to be non-static or static. They are non-static by default. If it's static, you can call it without referring to an object. And a non-static method is the default. It can only be used in conjunction with an object. That's why whenever we add methods to our main class, the one with the main method, we have to stick the word static in it because if we don't, then this is no longer going to work because we don't have an object to call it by. And please don't do what I'm about to do because uh, I'm going to immediately undo it. If I had to do that, here's what I would have to do to get this to work. Program p equals new program. I'd have to create an object and then I could call it a hello method. I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to make this static. all those horrible changes.
Non-static methods can call static methods, but not vice versa. Because when you're inside a static method, you don't have a reference to the object. All you know is the class name. So every method has a return type. If it's declared as void, it doesn't have to have a return statement. If its method is, if its uh, return type is anything else, like an int or a string or whatever, it has to have a return statement that will return a value that can be converted to that type. And here's our little comment. You could just call it a method type. So sure, I'll say the type of this method is int. Actually saying the word return in front of the name type is, does not take me that long, so I'm sure that I'll say it's return type is int. And so rules, the method name must be legal identifier. In other words, no spaces in it. Can't start it with numbers. Can't put asterisks and punctuation in it. And then the parameters. The parameter variables hold data that is passed to the method when it is called. You can have one parameter. You can have multiple parameters. Let's write a version of hello that takes a parameter. Public static void high string name. What's the difference between using string uppercase and string lowercase? There's apparently a class called string that differs from the data type called string. Interesting. All right, and so what are we going to do? When we call high, we're going to print out high followed by the name. So CW tab tab high comma space end quote plus name in parentheses semicolon. And when we call it, we have to provide an argument to fill in that parameter variable. Hi parentheses Susan end quote in parentheses semicolon. So this requires an argument to fill in a parameter variable. I'm going to keep calling them parameter variables even though this textbook only calls them parameters. About time to slow down. Now, as we've talked about previously, we can set default values for parameters. So I'm going to add a default value for this parameter. And then when I call high without any arguments, it's going to pick up that default parameter instead. So that's no arguments that a default value of the parameter will be used. All right, so it says, hi, somebody. Default parameters can make the code look cleaner if there's something that only rarely has to be customized about its behavior. Right? If you don't need to print the name most of the time, but every once in a while you do, then you can make it so that if no name is passed in, it behaves a little bit differently than if one name is passed in. Or you could create what are known as method overloads, where we write one version of this method that accepts a name, and then another version of the method that does not accept any parameter variables. So the parentheses are inside or the parameter variables are inside the parentheses. They're separated by commas. It's known as the parameter list. Main does not have a parameter list. It can be modified to have a parameter list, in which case it could pick up command line parameters. If you wrote a C sharp program and then you wanted to call it from the command line, you know, my prog and you wanted to be able to do this, like my prog, and tell it to do something to C colon backslash, you'd have to modify the main header, the method declaration, to accept a little bit more information, which is going to be a, a, an array of strings. 
where each element that you give as a uh, command line parameter would fill in one of the members of the array. So here they've written a method called show welcome message, which is an awful lot like our hello function, our hello method. So you can define variables and constants in a method. Good thing, because we've been doing that day one, right? Everything that we put inside main is declared within the main method, right? You data two, you could declare a variable up here. I don't know why I'm declaring x, but now the high method has an, a variable named x. That's called a local variable. It's local to the high method, meaning it cannot be accessed anywhere else unless it returns that value. X doesn't even have a value, right? It's unused. But if it did have a value and it was important for the calling code, the client, to get it, one of the ways we could do that would be to have a return statement that said return X. So parameters variables are also considered to be local variables. Just because I have the word name here doesn't mean I could get a hold of it here. This variable is local to the high method, so no getting to it from hello. Parameter variables are considered local variables. And x is local to the high method, cannot be accessed outside this method. It disappears as soon as the closing braces is executed. C Sharp has a garbage collector built into it so that if you create an object and then there are no references to it by the time the closing parentheses, excuse me, closing braces hit, the garbage collector will come and release that memory, which is a marked difference from C++ where you have to worry about that kind of thing. And it's very similar to how Java and Python do it. Now when I say it's not accessible to any other method, it certainly is accessible if you pass it into something else, right? If we gave this a value, just pretend, and then we called another function, I don't know what it's, it's going to be called, uh, whatever, right, ABC, and we passed X into it. Yeah, now that variable, or at least its contents, is available inside another method. But just by default, it's accessible only inside that method. Passing X into another method so its value can be used. Now, if you need have more than one method that need the same variable, you could declare that variable as a member of the class. I could make a static int x variable. Both of these methods would be able to change it. If you have a legit need for that, you're going to do that, right? Like you have a radius value, and all the methods in your sphere class are going to use that radius. In that case, you would declare your radius as being a member of the class meaning it's outside of any specific method. So here's our example. A is local to the method with its own A, and it is passed inside another method so that the right line method can actually use that number to print it out. So, writing a method that requires a single argument. Well, we just did that with the name method. You gotta have the type of the parameter and a local name for the parameter, just like what we did here. Where's our hello function? Well, excuse me, our hi function. Gotta have a name for it, you gotta have a type. Unlike Python, we can leave that out, right? Can't do that here, have to specify the type a more rigorously typed language like C++ and Java. You declare it within the method and here they're going to use some terms which 
are a little bit odd, which is that the method header contains the so-called formal parameter and that the actual parameters are the arguments. I'm never going to use the word actual parameters and formal parameters. If you feel like it, you can. The formal parameters are the parameter variables. The actual parameters are the arguments, which would mean that when we're looking at our code, this is an actual parameter. When we called hello, that's an actual par parameter. And then up here, that's the formal parameter. Nah, I'm not going to say that. This is the parameter, and this is the argument. The textbook uses that terminology as well, along with every other textbook on the planet, so we're going to go with that. However, formal and actual parameters, if you ever take a four-year programming course, maybe you'll hit it again, I don't know. I don't even remember them being called that in those classes. I'm sure it's computer scientifically precise, but everybody will know what you mean if you just call it an argument. I'm not going to ask you a quiz question over the difference of a formal and an actual parameter. So this method, called display sales tax, accepts an argument, fills in a parameter variable called sale amount. And what's it going to do? It's going to convert sale amount by applying a sales tax to it. Kind of occurs to me that the sales tax probably ought to be passed in as another parameter or it ought to be declared as a constant somewhere so that it could be easily customized. If I send this to my friend in Colorado where the sales tax is lower then they're not going to be able to use this program unless they actually edit the source code. It's a so-called magic number. So methods can take any number of parameters but the arguments must match in number, type, and relative position. It can do automatic conversion if it's a compatible type that'll convert cleanly without loss of data. Ints can turn into longs. Ints can turn into floats or doubles or decimals. Longs can turn into floats or doubles or decimals. But a float cannot turn into an int or a long because data would be truncated, right? Or at least possibly truncated. You, you would, if there was any fractional component, you know, decimal point, it'd get lost. And floats can turn into doubles. Pretty much anywhere up this chain is acceptable, but going back down the chain is not. It's called promotion and demotion. Data promotion is fine. You can promote an int to a long. It's fine. Can't promote a long to an int because you could hold numbers like in the quazillions in a long, and an int can only hold up to two billion. Remind me what P does. Oh, percentage. Displays a number as a percentage. And then C displays it as currency, meaning you'll get a, you know, a dot followed by two zeros, since that's what we like to see. So a method can return, at most, one value. Now, Python's crazy, and it can return a whole bunch of values. You could return 3, 4, 5, 6 inside Python, and that one return statement sends all those values back to the calling program, but it's the only language I've ever seen like that. If you had to pass back more than one value, you'd want to stick it in an array or some other similar structure. But for now, we'll just accept that a method can only return one value. Now, that doesn't mean you can only have one return statement. You could have more than one return statement. That's totally cool. I have to wrap this up soon, and I don't I don't know if we're going to have any homework on this or not. I think we will. So if you wanted to write a function that returned a value and had more than one return statement, you could do this. I'm going to write it as bool, so it will return true or false based on whether that number is even or not. So public static bool parentheses int x. That's the number we're going to check. Wait, wait, wait. I forgot to give it a method name. Is even. That's my method name. And so how are we going to check to see if it's even? The classic way. You modulus it by 2, and if the remainder of that is equal to 0, it's even. So if x modulus 2 equals equals 0, it's even. So we're going to return true. Else, we're going to return false. 
So you can have as many return statements as you need in a function, but only one of them is going to execute. The first time it hits one, the rest of the code is skipped. Right? If we hit true here, it doesn't matter if there's 8 million lines after it. That's the only one that's going to get executed. As soon as it hits a, re a, a return statement, it's kind of like a break statement in a loop. It'll break out of the loop right then and there, and it doesn't matter if there's 700 statements following it inside the loop. Just terminates execution of the loop right there and returns. All right, so what are we going to do? What can we do? I'm going to give an example of a static function. Public static double add. And it's going to take a double as a parameter and another double as another parameter. And it's going to return x plus y. Stop me if this is too, way too similar to something we wrote earlier. Right, and so when I'm ready to call it, I'm just going to call it like this. Like down in main, int result equals add, you know, 10 and 20, like that. And then you can print out, right, that you added those numbers. Now I've done a mistake. Oh, because this is declared as double, so I better not try to store it in an int. I need to change that to a double. So I want you to write several different methods that work the same way. Just make them all static. So the homework is going to be write methods that will add or divide or multiply or subtract one value from the other. Ask the user to enter two values and then call all those methods printing the results of each one. Passing those two values in as arguments. Why not modulus 2? Let me move that add method down here so that it's right above main. And then I'm going to stop the recording and make our Dropbox, etc. I'll post an, an announcement to this effect, but the projects folder has been flushed out with a description for each project type that I list. Or you can make up your own, but email me about it or ask me about it in class. And so there's an assignment. What project are you doing? By Sunday, you should certainly have chosen what project you want to do. So just upload a little note. Or when you submit it, you can just toggle over and do the text input and type in something without even, without even uploading anything. And if that doesn't seem to work for you, if it confuses you, go ahead and upload a note saying which one.